I'm Mike Lyons, your host for another oral history for the Jacksonville Broadcasters Association. The association's purpose is to preserve the rich history and contributions of the area's radio, television, and broadcasting industries. The association is open to those past and present broadcasters and those affiliated with the region's broadcasting industry and entities who have served this region's proud broadcasting heritage. We welcome students who are focusing their careers on the broadcasting industry. My guest today on this oral history is Bill Zetterauer, a longtime television news photographer, more than 30 years in the business, uh, known as Bill Z. I call you the Z Man. Bill, thanks for being with us today. Good to be here, Mike. Right. Yes, now, sir. you're you, you're a Nassau County native. Right. You live in O'Neill between Uly and Fernandina right. Beach. You lived there forever. When you were young, what got you into the broadcasting industry? Why, why were you interested in it? Well, how did you end up in the broadcasting industry? Boy. Oh, boy, start at the beginning, I guess. <laughs> um, when I was five years old in 1952, I turned five in November 1952, and um, my folks, I think, kind of used my birthday as a, as a reason to buy a television. Now, you remember in 1952, we only had one channel in Jacksonville, and TV really had, had only started existing in any form in about... 47, 48, right after I was born. So it was a new thing. And very, oh, way less than probably a third of the population had televisions in 52. The explosion came right after that and everybody started getting TVs. So my folks bought a television. Well, I, I'll be honest with you, Mike, it was, um, it was like magic in a box. I would look at the TV and, and I'd, I'd watch shows like Howdy Doody and, you know, some of them shows back then and, and the old Westerns and all. And, 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 you know, in my mind, it's like they lived in there and they just came out to perform at certain times. That's a stupid thought, but on the other hand, it was that magical. You loved television. And I loved, I loved to get it. Start. And then later on, um, I always liked photography and stuff like that. In November, interestingly enough, of 65, uh, my wife and I, Kathleen, she is now my wife for 50-some years, um, and, uh, but we were, we were dating at that time, and, and, uh, and we were both young, you know, and uh, we were still in school, still in, uh, in high school. And um, we were having some lunch at uh, Walgreens in Gateway Shopping Center, and the, uh, they had a big sale on their cameras, and they had a Kodak eight millimeter fun saver camera. The eight millimeters were going out and the Super 8s were coming in, have $12.50. Wow. So waiting on the order, I wandered around and saw the thing and I said, wow. I went back and I told her, I says, they got a, a movie camera for $12.50. And of course, $12.50 was a lot more than it is now. Right. But then she says, well, I'm gonna buy you that for your birthday. And she did. And that got me taking home movies. And once that happened, one thing led to another and to another. And on TV and news, you like news. Yeah, like yeah you uh, really oh, like yeah, watching the yeah, news. yeah. Um, 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 we we were talking, um, and I think it's a good thing to say about it. Once again, November, November the twenty second of sixty three, when President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, we were talking about this earlier in this week, you and I. Before that time, TV had not become up truly of age. Before that time, radio and especially newspapers and magazines, they were the source for news. TV was, yeah, also ran. They, they do news, you know, but, you know, but you went to the newspaper to get your news. Well, that, that Friday afternoon when it happened and things were unfolding by the minute, and then Sunday when, when, when uh, Ruby killed Oswald live on television and all, and for the first time in my life, I remember TV being on 24 hours a day, and it was all about that. The funeral, I think, was on Monday. So that whole weekend was just solid. And that was when TV became of age and began, gained the respect as the top news provider for the nation. Mm -hmm. And from that day on, it's pretty well gone on. People like Chet Huntley, David Brinkley, Walter Cronkite, ones like that then really took on a different role. Mm -hmm. And then I got involved in it. I think getting back to the question, right. I, I got involved in. I bought, and, yeah. I bought an old 16 millimeter projector, and uh, and uh, I didn't have any film for it. And somebody told me about a guy named Bill Alexander in Fernandina. He 
had been in business all of his life in the news business, anchor, reporter, re photographer, everything. And he was working weekends, actually, at 12. Uh, he, uh, and he, uh, uh, I contacted him to get some film to use, and he ended up inviting me to come over with him. And I went in the back door, and I became a stringer later, and then later became full-time, part-time and full-time, and then chief. Mm -hmm. A stringer, when you're talking about a stringer there, how yeah. you started, that was where you just, you handled news that was in Nassau for, County, for people, which was, yeah, for people at that time was 40 miles away right. from the TV yeah. studio for Channel 12 and other stations oh, yeah. in Jackson. When, when you say you're a stringer some, and you're freelance, people think, oh, you're doing it for free and you're some kind of, we don't know what stringer means. What stringer means is like you're their dedicated guy for that area. And... Freelance means that you are working on your own. In other words, they pay you per story. And so um, I got uh, the job as a, as a freelancer for 12, and I, um, I would cover wrecks, rapes, murders, you know, any especially spot news. I'd go out in the middle of the night and shoot the wreck or murder. Or I remember a Christmas Eve murder, I especially remember, and stuff like that, double murder, actually. And... and uh, and then that led on into me doing some part-time work, and then that led on me to being full-time. Mm -hmm. Now, you, when, and you would shoot it sometime. You told me for two or three, you would take two or three. We, we're not supposed to talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> Howard Kelly may hear this or something. He's already oh, he's got long, enough against me to long, bring me back and fire me. That's in um, the past. But, but you um, would shoot it. For I, I, my, at that time, my loyalty was to Bill Alexander <laughs> and his wife's name, Sue. And Sue was the stringer for Channel 4. And I was the stringer at that time, actually, in the very beginning of that, he was a stringer for 12, and he got, he got me to go see an old buddy of ours, Larry Lyle, at 17, and I got a job there as their stringer. So all three stations, we were the, um, we, we covered it. And, and Bill sometimes wouldn't be available or go out, and he'd send me and her, and when we did, we would usually shoot for our station and for him. Right. And then he would take it so all. So you give two different films, one to seventeen, yeah, and one to twelve. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, well, there was two paychecks. That was there, the way to go. There, 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 there was a. <laughs> I, forgive me for saying this because this is probably not something I should say. A guy named Rupert Rupert uh, Chastain. You're right. Rupert. Was a legendary stringer, uh, freelancer <laughs> for every station in Florida. We never could figure out how he could get from Daytona to Palaka <laughs> in 45 minutes. But he could all he could do it. I, I worked mean, with him out of Brunswick. He oh, was big in Brunswick. He was he was a legend, and and he did he would carry. Back then, see, you didn't copy film, so you, if you needed two or three cameras, <laughs> so he had do camera here and a camera here, and he'd shoot it, and he would shoot it here. And the the joke was, and forgive me because it was it's not a funny subject, but they were used to the thing that we used to do a lot, which you never see anymore, is them loading the body into the hearse or bringing out the body. You don't see that much. How oh, was the last time you saw that? And but that was something that you always should have. And because Ruben was shooting for three or four stations at one time, the joke was he knew every ambul ambulance driver, he knew everybody, <laughs> and he would say, "Load him again for Channel Two, fellas." <laughs> I don't know if that really happened or not, uh, but you, well, probably, Howard Kelly, could probably tell you if that was true or not. That had to be a lot of fun, Warby, when you just first started. You were just oh, covering yeah. everything. Oh, yeah. Different oh, things. it was, you it were was like, brand new. You were young, and you were right there where everything was yeah. happening. Talking about things first starting, I'll switch over just a minute and mention a great lady in TV, uh, um, Virginia Atta Keys. Uh, I think we could call her the first lady <laughs> of television, because she really was. Uh, started back in the late 40s over Channel 4. Mm -hmm. I don't usually use four-letter <laughs> words on TV, but excuse me. Uh, uh, but uh, a four-digit word. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, she told a great story about how she was working in one of the clubs. She was a singer. Like, she was like 19 or something. And uh, I think it was George Washington. I'm not sure. And she got spotted by some people from four who would come over after the show and, all, and, you know, and, 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 and get something to eat and all. And they hired her. But the point I'm trying to lead to, she told us, she says, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. He, she said, we went into the studio, and we didn't know anything about makeup. We didn't understand miking TV, because everybody had been in radio. All those first guys came out of radio. She said, we didn't know anything about lighting, you know, and how to shade things. And we didn't know what looked good or bad with clothes. 
And she said, we just played it by ear. And we didn't know what the public wanted. That was back when they had all the early shows where they would come out and sing and, and tell <laughs> jokes and, 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 and do a little news and whatever. But that was the way it was. And anyway, that was back in the early days. And I fell in love with that era. And then later, um, when Bill invited me to come over to the station, and I, he first thing he did is throw a camera at me and say, go shoot cars, shoot cars in the parking lot. I need to show that people are here. And I did. And when I saw my stuff on TV, I was like, oh, my God. So he was one of your bigger influences. He, I worked, he was, when I went he was a mentor for right. sure. When I interned yeah. at, at uh, 12 yeah. out of college in 76, uh -huh. I met Bill. I bought a camera from Bill uh, that I would use. So did I. You did. I have so it with you. me today. <laughs> and, right. And, and um, he just had to be a big help to you. I mean, he I was. He was. He was. Buick, a, when he had all kind of TV equipment in that he, he, he knew more about it and forgot more about it than most people would ever know. And he was, um, and I'll say this about Bill, um, wasn't maybe the easiest guy to get along with and, you know, had his pros and cons. But I think he's probably the closest thing to a genius that I'd ever seen. The man, as far as knowing, like, uh, not, just, not just news and programming and stuff, but the electronics. He was so into that electronics and ham radio and all. I mean, he, he just knew how to rebuild something or fix something and uh, transmitters and stuff. How did you end up being full-time at Channel 12? Uh, let's see, I was working as a stringer and I got, um, they asked me to work weekends. So I started working weekends shooting news and then uh, a vacancy came open suddenly at our Beaches Bureau in Jacksonville Beach with Norma Brizzy who was also a great help for me. She, she, she knew what she was doing and I didn't at the time. And she helped me a lot, and uh, and uh, so I ended up starting to work with Norma five days a week, and I also kept my Saturday gig at the station. So I was doing six t six days a week, something that the station called full time part time, <laughs> without benefits. <laughs> when you're and married, I, had kids. Yeah, well, I had a couple kids. Yeah, they're married and had a couple kids, and uh, and uh, then um, and then uh, uh, news director come along and said, Hey, Bill we want you to go full-time and you said you'll get benefits and we're going to raise your salary and we're going to buy you a new car and all that <laughs> which we did I got a brand new vehicle and and um, I just said wow I said I think I want to do that and I did it and then about five years later I guess I became chief photographer Talk to and me I was about chief for 20 years right the chief what what did that chief photographer what did that involve at a at a tv station being the chief photographer well I was unlike some other chiefs that we had. We had one chief that had a, basically a contract where he didn't shoot. <laughs> he was managed, and, uh, and that was good. Um, uh, of course, my thought of staying in that building all day was kind of like jail. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I shot a lot. <laughs> and uh, it, was right, it was right at the beginning of, uh, we were just getting into live shots then. Uh, live shots were unique. We would... We would talk about a live shot, Mike, instead of saying, we got six live shots in the shows tonight. We would say, see, it's Monday, right? Okay, Thursday, we got a live shot downtown. And they would send a photographer, a producer, two, two engineers, <laughs> the talent. And, I mean, it was like a bunch of us out there. Right. And, uh, and now it's, it was just, it's just... Like that. Do it but, that. but that's the way it was back then, and uh, uh, we, uh, you know, it grew from there. But I was, I was doing, I started, I think I got off point a little bit of what we were talking about. But we were, uh, I, I was working full time, um, six days a week actually, and then they asked me full time, and I started doing that. And then, um, oh, you asked me chief photographer job. The, the chief photographer um, basically was over the photographers over the, all the camera equipment and over all the vehicles. And he was over all the news trucks, and what would you say? Now, engineering was basically over, over um, the live trucks. But I, I managed all the all There's a the lot trucks. of photographers and a lot of cameras and, and, and a lot of vehicles and, yeah, and, involved. Yeah, and scheduling and um, discipline and finding people, hiring and firing and all that kind of stuff, which is not fun. <laughs> And, um, and then, but the, the, I, I think what made me a little different than maybe a lot of guys, because I was a little, little bit older. I was in my 20s when I started at 12, I was 28. And uh, 
by the time I became chief, I was in my 30s, and a lot of the new young photographers right out of school or something, some of them, you know, you had a lot of them in their 20s. And I kind of felt like I was their big brother or something and tried to look out for them. I remember parents before, you know, a parent living in Michigan, their son's now in Florida, his first, first or second time, his first time he was away from home, he was in college and I he got a job. And I'd sometime comfort him and tell him, hey, anything goes wrong, I'll be there and I'll call you. You, you were know. like a father to him, I a tried mentor, to. and, and, and I, I know over the years a lot of them have come back for your, uh, when you retired, and a lot of them yeah. really I love them guys. I love them. I love them. Uh, and um, they you. <laughs> the guy running this thing back here right now, Ken Thomas, <laughs> one of my guys. But I, I tried to stay out of their business, but I tried to be in their business with uh, marriages and finances and everything because, you know, a happy employee is a good employee. And you want a person who's going to be good, be honest, feel like working, and have respect for you. But a, a, a great honor that someone said, I heard someone say one day, they said, Bill never does anything that he don't ask us to do. And I think maybe you said that. <laughs> Somebody said that. But that was, uh, that was a great honor, I thought, to be thought of that, like that. Because I did. I shot my heart out, edited my heart out, did live shots all the time, and still tried to hold it hold everything together. The biggest change you saw in Plus 30, you started in mid-70s, oh boy. is technology. Yeah. And we can start with the first part of technology. You were in film. Film. And grab your little uh, prop oh, here there it is. that you got. Here that it is was here. one of your first this ones you a, ever had. This is a Bell & Howell <laughs> 70 series <laughs> yeah. camera. The first one I ever had. I bought this one from a guy with a light, light and a and a light meter for that I think, weighs, $90. That weighs a little bit. Too. We call them turtle shells because you take this thing and throw it on the ground and it'd never know it. Yeah. This camera has been the staple in the news business, was the staple for the 40s and for newsreels in the 40s. Uh, uh, TV, when it came in the late 40s and 50s, uh, it did it all. It did it all for many years and still was being used by people like me in the 70s and when we were still in the business because it was cheap to buy, and it was a good quality camera. From Used a roll of 16 millimeter roll, film. Yeah, How long was that? Did that you had roll two and a half from? minutes on a roll of 16 millimeter film, basically. How do we load those? Did we have to load you, them in a well, bag where the light wouldn't hit the film? No, you could load it without that, but but uh, and you and uh, well, you could also unload it without that because it had a black reel in it. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, the, <laughs> the the interesting thing about it is is that uh, you had two and a half minutes, and the station film was expensive. And, uh, and the station would like for you to do two events on that two and a half minutes. Now you go out and you shoot a wreck, eh, 15, All you 20, want. 30 minutes. <laughs> right. You know, then you shot about, what, a minute and a few seconds, and then you stopped and said, hey, I got to save the other half the reel because I'm going to a fire now. Right. Talk yeah. about the film developing. Oh. Now, that was every, a, <laughs> early in the day. I started in film. Not YouTube, many of us did, but the, that was... It was a pain. Yeah. There's not <laughs> many know, guys left to stay there and talk that shot film. It, it just it was it, a pain. It's been gone for a really. long time. Yeah. Um, if you remember, Mike, we had to have everything in by about three or three thirty in the afternoon. And there was no five o'clock, no five thirty shows. It was a six. six. Had to have everything in so that it could be processed. Now you had to run it through the soup we called it and process it. Then it had to dry. That took a if it ran oh, through the thing took oh, about about an hour and then an hour to dry and then an hour, oh, you know and, and then you had a, you had to edit it <laughs> to, to you know link it together to put on the show. You glued the pieces yeah. together now, edit uh, it through pieces. You, you literally it. you literally did that. Then we had a machine that you would do like that. It actually it put tape on it. It was taped together instead of a. But the deal about cutting, you would say, I got to go cut that. I haven't cut that yet. Uh, literally, then wasn't electronic cutting. It was literally. <laughs> Cutting it, and I remember um, guys who was well knew knew what they were doing real well. They would be wanting footage for something, and they would just take the film and go, "Okay, five seconds, ten seconds, 15. <laughs> they had figured out how long it took for and that much film to run. A foot of film equaled about a, a second, did it not? Um, was that right? Like, so if you oh, needed. Oh no! Well, wait a minute. There was uh, on a on a. We were using a hundred foot reels, and it lasted two and a half minutes. So a foot was what. Uh, you have to think uh, five, that up, 60 uh, yeah. and uh, two and Four a half. Four seconds or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, um, and what you would do, Mike, or the good subject we could talk about, you could, you got to, say, an accident, a, a bad wreck. You got out. 
you, you took your camera, you got a stationary shot, a wide shot, and you would do like one, two, three, four, five. Then yeah. you'd go in and get a medium. <laughs> then you'd go in and get a close-up of the fender all torn up and the engine sitting in the front seat and all. And that was so you wouldn't and, have to <coughs> cut the film. Yeah, you so that you could literally edit in the camera. You could literally just go f five seconds, we ten seconds. We called that editing in the camera. Yes, sir. And, and because you had a limited amount of time with film and all that, but you would, um, then you would go and you'd get a cut shot, as we used to call it, like a hubcap or something like that. But he was editing, like you said, in the camera. <laughs> And uh, talk about film. You had a lot of picking up film and trying to get oh, film to the station. Well, okay. We went I, I was thinking the other day, I, I, was, I got in, and I'm, I'm very thankful that I got into business at the time that I got into it um, because you know, the really golden age of TV was the 40s and 50s and 60s, but it, was a lot, but it didn't change much in the 70s. Uh, and things that we have now that we didn't have then, satellite, <laughs> yeah. Micro, microwave, uh, our first microwave truck didn't have a mask on it to put it up, and it's line of sight. You got to you got to literally hit the tower with it. So you know if you're low, you don't go. You know, <laughs> yeah. and so um, our old truck, you climbed on the top of the back of it, and it had a little dish, and you would turn it and look through it like a rifle, and you'd find the the, the tower and lock it in. <laughs> so if you had anything blocking you, you were in trouble. In the other later years, they came out with the mask. <coughs> the long uh, 30 30 foot mask yeah. <coughs> and that allowed you to go out of town and shoot you know places the beach and all because you could get a, a signal back to a thousand foot tower right you told about a story of film uh, one time about uh, there was a oh. murder up in Saint uh, Simon's Island oh yeah and what Boy, you did well, to get the we, film back to the station we'll jump all around here <laughs> might as well um, back uh, uh, okay back back again we didn't have we didn't have the microwave with the sat trucks didn't have cell phones uh we did uh in in the station we had teletype machines and you walked in the station and you just say all the typing that's gone now right. you know it's all computer the old guys working on on the old typewriters type that's gone uh we had uh we at the very beginning we and of my top time we didn't have pagers then we got pagers we used two-way radios in the car like the similar to what the police has, and we um, we didn't have uh, what we didn't have. We didn't have uh, cell phones, and we didn't have you know any of that capability. And so, back to what you were saying, there was a murder one weekend at Sea Island in uh, in Georgia, in Brunswick, and there was a. Um, uh, it's one of them things that the, the uh, gardener ended up doing. It, it was kind of like a Columbo movie, but the gardener ended up doing it. And, um, but it was a big thing there. Obviously, it was the former president, I think of, uh, oh gosh, it was president of- A big company. A major company. company. I, I, think it was, I think it was um, one of the big oil companies, something like uh, Exxon or mm -hmm. something. He'd been a president of that. Well, anyway, he and I think his wife both were murdered. Long story short, it was a place where this never happened. So we really wasn't welcome there to cover it because Things like that just didn't happen on that in that neck of the woods, so to speak. But we went in, obviously had to go in and cover it. But we shot film of it, and we got there early, and we got, actually we shot tape of it, excuse me. And we were there early, and we got some really good stuff. The problem was, it's now, you know, 1 o'clock and a half. How do we get it to Jacksonville? We can't leave, you know. And they didn't have anybody to send at that time to get it or anything. And so... We found uh, a, a standby for us that we use, a Greyhound bus. We found a Greyhound bus station, and the guy was there, and they, they, they just pulled in, and we pulled in, and we said, when's the next bus to Jacksonville? And he said, that bus right there is fixing to leave for Jacksonville. And we said, oh, boy, how, how quick is he going to leave? He said, oh, not, not long. <laughs> You're getting on now. <laughs> and the bus driver is there welcoming people on. So I had a, a girl with me, a young girl reporter, and I said, uh, I said, you go in there and take this and do the paperwork. I'm going to try to stall the bus driver. <laughs> so I went out to the bus, and the bus driver was standing there. And I just went up, and I said, how you doing today? <laughs> good. I said, man, I said, boy, I said, this is something. I said, I work for a TV station out of Jacksonville. I said, I'm up here covering a, a serious murder. 
I said, you know, at President of Exxon or something, you know. And, <laughs> oh. So I got him hooked enough that he wanted to know more. So I kept peeling it like an onion. Like I'd say, yeah, I said, it wasn't far from here. Well, where was it? Well, you know where you go in Pine Island, uh, Pine, whatever it was called. And he said, yeah, yeah. I, and so everything I would add a couple of sentences to and, 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 li and give him a reason to ask me another question. So he's doing that and it's getting to be past time for him to leave. <laughs> I look and I saw her come running out with the package. You delayed him long enough? I, and I handed it to him. I said, would you please deliver that to Jacksonville? <laughs> My people will be there at the station again. Right. And he took it. That was the early days of broadcasting. And near the, in, the, in our later days in broadcasting, you're like, like us in the... 2008, I believe, as you retired, or 09? Oh, uh, late eight, uh, first day of 09. The biggest <laughs> difference at the end was the, was how fast you oh, could get it on the air. Te technology. Just unbelievable. Technology. And, um, and, 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 and I, I want to say this, and, 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 and with all sincerity, uh, everyone tries to do their best, or just about everyone tries to do their best. No, no, no organization is perfect. But what happens is it got speeded up with tape and it got speeded up with live shots but now it's on like overdrive and what has happened is the technology i think has gotten past the human ability to deal with it <laughs> and what i mean to say is that when you and i used to bring something in there'd usually be a couple of hours before we would edit it well that time is very valuable because that gave a reporter time to double check or triple check a source. That gave us time as photographers to be sure that we shot the right guy on the picture. Yeah. All of that. Now it is so fast that they seem to have to put it on before we actually know what's going on. But they try to tell you this is what we know now. Yeah. But that's great. It's good in a way. But it, it, it opens the doors for a lot of, of mistakes because what you hear at 3 o'clock may be different at 4 and maybe back to what you heard at three at five, right? You know, right. That was a disadvantage of film and that, because it take you two hours to develop it. In that two or three it, hours, it could totally change. That's that. It was slow, but how many times did did it not matter by the time we got it? Right. The number of different stories that you covered over oh. your career had to be is just amazing. I mean, that had to be a part of the fun. You were doing something. That's one of the things about television broadcast. Something new every day. Yeah, well, you always knew the fair was coming to town. You always knew we were going to have hurricanes. You always knew there was going to be this other stuff. But every, every murder, every wreck, every rape, everything's different. Court cases, for example. And another thing, it's interesting. A guy who's good at doing court may not be good at doing sports. A guy doing good at sports may not be a good guy for spot news. <laughs> so you try to, people try to be put where they would do their, their best job. But it was, it was something different all the time. And um, it was always the same, but always different. Right. You have so many stories. Uh, I know, but going back, you could, we could talk for two days right here on the yeah. air about all the stories yeah. you have. One of your favorites is a story about the Pope mess up. That oh, you had the Pope. Day. Tell that one as quick uh, as you can of what happened well, there. I, that was, I, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to credit it to <laughs> Deanna, uh, uh, Deanna Finney Finney. was with me, I do think. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time, and I'm most certain it was Deanna. Um, and please, everyone, take understand. Not, we were being respectful about this. But we felt weird about it too. Um, the um, the Pope was in, in dire situation. He was in bad, bad shape, and it was probably a, a we'd call it the death watch was on. Everyone was looking for the white smoke in the chimney and all those things that denotes the death of the Pope. Well, long story short. Um, we went, was covered, asked to go out to the diocese to cover it, and we did. And we got out there, and the bishop was very nice to us, let us in, let us shoot all kinds of stuff of the Pope, the stuff that they had there. And we interviewed him about how he was feeling about the sadness going on and all. And the diocese has a lot of, a lot of people working in it. It's not a, not a two-man operation. And um, that led to him doing an interview on the subject of, how he's feeling about the condition of the Pope. Well, after that, we thanked him. We told him we'd be around all day. When the event occurred, we'd probably go live and we might want to talk to him. And he said, no problem. Please make yourself at home. So we went outside and we got outside and we got a call from the desk from the station. 
and they said the Pope had died. It had been reported and that this had happened and that had happened and the Pope had died. So we looked at him and said, well, what we just shot don't matter. I mean, the interview with him, now it's changed. We go back in, so we go back in, and he hadn't hardly got seated back in his office, and they, he come right back out. And we said, sir, we made a mistake. We had some bad information. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, got we, told him we got some new information that the Pope has died. And oh, man, that was, that was bad. And uh, we did another interview with him about that. And he said, I want to hold a uh, chapel service for everyone in the building. And he held a chapel service and invited us in. And we went into a, a chapel service for the, for the past pope. We got all of that done and left again. Got a call and was told the pope hadn't died. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 it, was, it was a terrible mistake. Uh, unintentional of course and we went back in and got things straightened out now later that day or that night the Pope did die hmm. but that's some of the things you go through uh, I think that was my most embarrassing and moment that just shows you the importance of broadcaster and news people getting it right getting it and right the right yeah thing because yeah and then he they had to do his thing over there and it's just that was that lead me into a thought that you had mentioned one time that I had said that it um, uh, we, the importance of getting it right, one thing I'll say to somebody, to somebody like Ken Amaro, he, he kind of, he's the, you know, t Ken on your side type guy and did all these consumer stories and was always on trying to help someone out. Go on working with him and seeing how stories change from the person you interview here that's been so wronged and you feel like, oh my gosh, these people have been so wronged and then you go see the man they're blaming it on and the story he tells you just totally turns it around. And, it's, and a guy like Ken is so needed because they care and worry about it being right. I mean, let's check it and double check it and triple check it because <clears throat> we meet people every day in this business. And we meet people on the very best day of their life, the day that they literally won the lottery. We've interviewed a lot of people who won the lottery last night. Or a child is saved And then the um, child is saved, found their child in the woods. And then the next story you have may be the person who house burned down and lost his whole family. And so you get this guy in the very best day of his life and this guy in the very worst day of his life. And you have to understand that that's a, that's a responsibility that you've got to take seriously. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, like, with the um, uh, Ken and 12 on your side. You can damage a person's reputation or their business, then they can't recover from it. So you don't need to make a mistake. That's why those things are very, you know, got to be handled very, very gently. You mentioned a few names of some people you work for, but yeah. you've met a lot of people in this job. And oh, you yeah. work with a lot of different people. That had to be one of the more interesting things about working in broadcast. Well, you, I know I got a little story on every governor. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I mean, you do too, probably. It, it, it's funny how um, you know you're waiting on the governor to fly in and show up, and you always know it's close um, because there's one governor. He always had to have a fan <laughs> blowing in his face. So when his aide went and plugged the fan in by the podium, everybody knew. It's close. The governor, <laughs> governor probably landed. He'll be in here in a minute. Right. Uh, things like that. <clears throat> you had other, other governors. They all had their own little quirks like that, little things they would do. Mm -hmm. uh, a great story uh, that I loved was uh, uh, Governor Graham. Uh, governor Graham had this thing that um, he could remember. He had this memory thing where he could remember your name, you know. And he, and so... I had met him one night, quickly interviewed him in the parking lot of a, of a, of a, of a garage parking, and he'd asked me my name and all, and, 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 and we had a few words about that. And a few months later, I had to go to a uh, meeting, um, one of their, uh, um, what you call it, cabinet meetings in, uh, in uh, Tallahassee. <laughs> we went there, and, uh, and we had to interview the governor. So as it ended, I had a reporter with me by the name of Al Rossi. As it ended, 
we kind of rushed up there to get to the governor to ask him a question. And he looked at me and he said, hey, Bill. <laughs> and I said, hey, governor, how you doing? Well, my reporter, after that, he says, did, I didn't know you knew the governor. I didn't know you knew, the governor knows you. You know, the, how you know the governor? And I played, I said, oh, we're old buddies. We used, well, we used to do, he used to, you know. And um, then later I told him, I said, no, Al. I said, he makes a point to remember a name. And he has some kind of that memory thing or something you do to do it. Hmm. What do you miss most about? Uh, you've been retired now for about, what, 10 years? I think, 11, 11. I think 11 years, I believe, 11 years. What do you uh, miss most about the business? No, I mean, we, 12 years, I guess, is yeah, coming up. Well, somewhere along in there. What do you miss most about the business? Uh, the people, my friends, going to work, and the water cooler stories, and all them things that you, you don't think about when you're working the camaraderie, the something different every day. And you know in the news business, Mike, every day is something different and every story you're doing is the most important story in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, you, you lose that, that, that everything is uh, on, on a deadline and you gotta do it now and that, you know. Right, every day there's, every a, every day. Day there's a deadline. And then now 15 deadlines. <laughs> uh -huh. You, you were one of the first official members of the Jacksonville Broadcasters Association. You go to all the meetings. What, what about that group? What does that mean to you? Well, to I, to I, I was privileged to be asked by Harry Reagan to join that group. And I don't know how far back it was, but that was before we had luncheons and were incorporated and did all that. We were meeting in a public library room. And um, Harry had a great vision. And I thank him and all the other leaders in that group that has made it true, come true because there needs to be known the history of broadcasting in Jacksonville. There's a lot of interesting things and a lot of interesting people. And, and, and great stories. And great been stories. Been able to, to tell. What would you say to young people that were considering getting into the communications or the broadcasting business? What would you say to them? Well, it's a different world than it used to be. It's a fast, fast world. I'd say if you don't, if, if you don't have the right mindset, you know, don't, don't get in it for any of the wrong reasons. Don't get in it because you think it's glamorous or you think you can make a lot of money or, or it's, it's just entertaining to you. If you don't, you've got to care about what we were talking about a while ago, the integrity of the stories. You've got to care about the people that you're reporting on because it's a make and break thing for a lot of them. You know, it's a funny thing. You, you go into a home and you do an interview and five years later, you're somewhere at J.C. Penney's or somewhere, and they walk up to you and say, hey, Bill, how you doing? Uh, and they know everything that happened from the minute you walked in the door to you left, and you can't remember what it was about or when. Uh -huh. and, and that's the way it is. So you've you got to take it very seriously. Uh, just uh, 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 you met a lot of people and a yeah. different kind of people, especially in the business. And you stayed in Jacksonville. You were in this area yeah. your whole time, yeah. like me. That's very unusual. A lot of people go from different market to market. What would you say the biggest, how would you describe the changes in this area, in, in Jacksonville area? I mean, uh, f from broadcasting point of view and just being living here, what? Oh, the, what, the, 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 the news, I mean, the, the TV news used to be like king. I mean, it was, it was like king. And, uh, and I mean, people, it's called now, it's called news by appointment. I mean, everybody waited to see the six or they planned dinner around the six or they planned their shower around the 11 or something, you know. And uh, that now is just, it's 24 hours a day. You can get, see anything you want right now on the phone. You don't have to wait. It's not news by appointment. It's news whenever you want it. And, and it's just, I mean, it, it's, it's so fast. I only worry about these things where stuff gets reported and it's not by a reporter or an employee of an organization that knows what he should be doing. Because it seems like the agencies now scare me a little because they take stuff and, and, and run with it too quick. They need, being first is wonderful, being right is everything. Right, everybody and, has, a, yeah. everybody has yeah. a phone which makes everybody in yeah. a way a news photographer. Yeah. And oh they yeah. Put yeah. a lot of stuff out there, and then the information that comes with it needs to be. And a lot of people out. don't understand what the news crews go through to get this on the air. I mean, when you think about the weather, you know, the hurricanes and the rain blowing sideways at you in the sand, and 
people threatening your life if you take a picture of their loved one or on and on and on and on. All those things that we go through. Um, we run into fires. We run into storms. We run into, into hostage situations. Mm -hmm. And been a it's a lot of danger in, in the job that you've been in. There's a lot of danger. A few being times I've really felt covering threatened. hurricanes and live trucks yeah. and things and all. I've that. had a, a one or two really close calls, really close calls, and there have been times that my fear of just being shot any second was really <laughs> there. I mean, uh, it's you know it depends on where you are, what you're doing, uh, and those things happen. But uh, the Jesse. The Jesse Lynn story, if I have time Jesse to Lynn tell Kirk. that real quick, but people understand what news people go through sometimes to make things happen. Jesse Lynn was a, uh, uh, I called her the queen of news in Jacksonville. She worked for the Times Union forever. She knew, you know, reporters and investigative reporters and all would come and go, but she was always here. She knew where all the bodies were buried, and she was just really a legend. And she told me the story about when President Reagan came to Mayport to a chapel service for the uh, soldiers killed in the uh, Beirut uh, uh, barracks, I believe right, it was. Right. And, he, and he was going around the country doing these different um, memorial services. And he came, and it was a, a morning type time that he came. And they were having to try to meet a deadline for their, for their newspaper in the afternoon at the time. We had an afternoon paper. And there was no way, they knew there'd be no way to get any uh, photographer film out, and this was before we could feed it, right. and no way to get that out of Mayport because of the lockdown, because of the president being there. So from Mayport all the way back to Jacksonville would just be all police and motorcades and stuff like that. So they, they thought about it, and they came up with an idea. You know, 35 millimeter film is about this big. They got a homing pigeon from Arlington, from a man that had a homing pigeon. <laughs> They took it to Mayport. The photographer took his film and put it on the wrist of the homing pigeon. Homing pigeon flew over the river to Arlington and delivered the film. And a guy on a motor scooter got it and scooted through everything and got it to the Times Union. That's what they did to get you a picture of the president on that afternoon news. News on people afternoon would do paper. anything necessary to get it. Anything on. that they could do legitimately, yes. Uh -huh. Sometimes at risk of their own life, I might add. Real quick, you yep. love the history of Brockhampton. Your garage at your house is oh, a collection. Boy. You've collected a lot of stuff. Real quick, some of the stuff you've uh, collected over the years. But this, this. I ran in the house and called my wife out and said, you got to hear this, you got to hear this. This is the mother load, the actual recording of the first words on Channel 12, the minute our TV station signed on the air. This is Television 12. Welcome to our home. A lot of stuff gets, when, when stations clean up, you know, they throw away stuff that they don't mean to. And I would, would always grab it and take it home. And I've got some of the old set off of Popeye and Pals with Skipper Ed. I've got, um, golly, I, I, I have a personal collection of televisions from the late 40s, as you know, you've seen it. Up radios to now. and radios. Radios, oh, and I'm into a lot of the electronic items like that and cameras and all, but I try to, <clears throat> try to preserve as much of the TV stuff as I can. And there's a lot of things that, uh, everything from a Christmas ornament that Channel 12 gave away to the, their sign-on um, uh, music uh, that they used to sign on, sign-on announcement to, to the first day they aired. We went on the air September the 1st, 1957. And we were the first all-color station in Jackson, in, in, the, in the country. We were, we were NBC, which tied us into... Uh, R RCA and RCA was a leader in color and so we had a lot of history there and by the way the Channel 12 history with the early days of, of Space Age were incredible. We basically did that for NASA because we were the closest big affiliate NBC uh, was the closest big, uh, closest big affiliate and our men worked down there. I was not part of that but they worked down there and they did a fantastic job. A lot of changes in broadcasting in 30 plus years in yes. Jacksonville. You've been a big part of that history. You got stories. We could talk for another oh, two Lord, hours, I, Bill. I, but you're a big influence to a lot of people, and people love you, and you did a great job. And I appreciate you coming here today and talking to us and 
telling us about that. It's been a great career. For well, you. I hope, hope it didn't bore you. <laughs> no, you couldn't bore I told us. the truth. <laughs> yeah. Bill, thanks for... Thank you thank so you much. Right, Mike. great.